has not given us a spirit of fear. Mental health begins with no fear. There is no more damaging false doctrine in my thinking today than the notion of moral inability. Love is the most intelligent way to live, as well as the most mentally healthy course of life. We're in a series called The Bible and Mental Health. And we're going to end up on the description from the Bible point of view what mental health is, and then also how to get there. And last week we started um, on the first part, and then uh, I, I left it room in your notes. But today we begin with discovering the fourfold foundation of mental health according to that which is given to us by God. So, uh, Heavenly Father, help us now and bless us, people. In thy holy name, I pray. Amen. Now, we've discovered before that there are three approaches to mental health. First of all, there's a biblical approach to mental health. Secondly, there's a psychological approach to mental health. And then there are those who merge the two, and we call this integrationalism, where they integrate psychology and biblical uh, approaches. And as you well know from last week, we pointed out, and it's in your notes, the weaknesses and the superiority, rather, of the biblical approach to mental health. And that's what we're here to study. So how does the Bible introduce the subject uh, of mental health? So this is where we want to begin. The foundation of mental health in the Bible is fourfold, is given to us. Notice this is something that God gives. God has not, here's what he has not given and what he has given. And so that is where our starting point is. And the first one is, he has not given us a spirit of fear. Mental health begins with no fear. You're going to learn in a moment that our fears are traitors. And so we want to spend a few moments on how fear affects mental health. How does fear affect mental health? Now, I want to tell you, first of all, that fear is contagious. I remember when my, my mother was afraid to drive and my father wanted her to learn to drive an automobile. My mother was afraid to do that. And, uh, and so uh, one day we were out for a family, my sister and I were in the back seat, and my dad convinced my mother to get behind the wheel. After driving two miles, not only was she afraid to drive, but we were afraid she would drive. <laughs> and that ended the whole deal. My mother never learned to drive, at least a car. And um, it's, it's kind of contagious. So uh, uh, how does fear affect our mental health? Well, let's uh, understand that fear is personally tormenting. This is not a nice way to live. It hurts. It divides, it incapacitates, it pulls us down, it aggravates, it distracts us. And so we have it clearly stated in the scripture that to have fear is a tormenting condition for any human being to try to endure. The second thing we learn from the scriptures about how fear affects mental health is that it incapacitates love. Notice the scripture, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. These two things are incompatible. When a person is in fear, they cannot truly love. Now, let's look at the rest of this verse. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear hath torment. Look at this now. And he that feareth is not made perfect in love. And in fact, uh, uh, one um, uh, 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 kind of a put together translation of this says, love banishes fear. Since fear is crippling, a fearful life is one that's not yet fully formed in love. And this is probably 
One of the worst things that could ever happen to anybody is to be rendered incapable of genuine love. So fear is personally tormenting, and fear incapacitates love. To incapacitate means to disable, to impair, to cripple love. It immobilizes, it puts out it, put, it puts love out of commission, okay? So this, this condition of fear damages our ability to function, and as we later, much later, we'll see how to live in love. Now, fear also prevents accurate decision-making. And uh, so what happens, and, and here's the story, you remember the, Lord distributed talents to, to one to five, one, to, one got ten, one got one. And, and look at what the one said. When it was time to report back, he said, I was afraid. And because I was afraid, I went and hid your talent in the earth. Because fear prevents us from making right decisions. It has way too much influence on us and caused us to think differently than a clear mind would do. It damages our decision-making ability. And then the fear causes compromise, the failure to take a stand. When, and, and here's the story. Saul said to Samuel, I've sinned. I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words. Now watch this. Watch this. Because I feared the people and I obeyed their voice. Now, we must grasp this as a damaging effect of fear. And so, normal convictions that we hold tend to get compromised when we're in the presence of those who don't have those same convictions. We back down. Why? Because of fear. What kind of fear? Usually it's the fear of not being accepted. We'll talk about that in a moment. <clears throat> and so uh, it causes us to compromise when, when we shouldn't. And then fear motivates to lying. We get this insight right from the scriptures. Of whom hast thou been afraid or feared that thou hast lied? So we think the truth is going to have some negative impact upon people. And so we either don't tell the whole truth or we tell part of the truth or we don't tell anything or we tend to distort or lie Because we fear the consequences of the truth. I'll never forget when, before Judith and I were married, <clears throat> we talked about all these kind of things. And she said to me, I learned to tell the truth because it's more adventuresome than lying. <laughs> uh, and so the fear then has the tendency to make us to tell less than what we should and to lie. Fear actually renders people unusable. It, it actually stops their ability to be used, both of God and in life. <clears throat> show me a person who is filled with fear, I'll show you somebody who has a hard time getting up in the morning, has a hard time getting to the job, has a hard time with relationships. Why is that? Because it damages us uh, at a deep, personal heart level. So comes the scripture now and says, go to and proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, now this is the Gideon story, by the way. They, they, they had this enemy, the Midianites, thousands of them, right? And so Gideon was to put together an army, and, uh, and he had too many. God says, you got too many people in your army. So whoever's got fear, whoever is fearful and afraid, let him return. Don't put him in the military. Let the fearful get out of this. 
And so he sent them away. Look at this. And they returned to the people. 20 and 2,000. 22,000 people of the army were afraid and they got sent home. They were unusable because of fear. Well, maybe we ought to learn a little bit of a national lesson from this. If America is going to be saved, it's not going to be done by fearful people. Old letters, capital letters. Don't miss that. Fear brings a snare. The fear of man brings a snare. Fear is a fear is accompanied by snares. They they tra- fear causes us to fall into traps that we otherwise could overcome and deal with. Now I want you to see though the second half of this verse. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoso puts his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Is that a good one or what? So we're going to see more about that in a moment. And then fear is the cause of anxiety, disorder, and much depression. Fear is the cause of anxiety, disorder, and depression. So let's talk about how that works. When we talk about anxiety disorders, they are put into categories by psychologists and psychiatrists and from medical organizations, and they include the following. The obsessive, little little typo there, compulsive disorder, OCD, we were very common with, known with that. And then what's called uh, GAD, general anxiety disorder, and then there's social anxiety disorder, and then there is panic disorder, and then there are specific phobias. Now, not every fear rises to the level of a phobia. However, if you go and you Google the phobia list, you'll find, I didn't count them exactly, but I went down the list, like in the A category of phobias, there was about a uh, hundred. And so I went through each of the letters of the alphabet with all the list of phobias, and there is about 700 phobias listed that people have today. Well, my friends, this is tragic. Because, because what happens is that phobia is a strong or irrational fear of something, or it could be someone, that, that really poses little or no real danger. And so... Um, we must address, as the Bible does, how to overcome, um, conquer the fear that causes the anxiety disorder. So here we understand anxiety. And it comes from fear, according to the scripture. And watch this now, because this is, this is kind of like the crucial point here, is that, that the fear comes from Information processing errors. Now, I know it sounds technical. I'm going to explain it and make it a little more vernacular in a moment. And so, we get information that we accept that produces fear. We fail to process accurately the information. And so, it produces fear, and the fear produces anxiety. So, let me just change this a little bit. I coined this word a few years ago, um, awfulizing. I did, I did a New Year's uh, session on awfulizing. And people go around, oh, and they're given reports of everything they think is awful. Uh, what she did is just awful. And, oh, I feel awful. And awful, awful, awfulizing. We, we, we tag so many things as awfulizing. And because we do that, awfulizing, out of that is birth fears, and then it produces anxiety. And uh, here's the problem, is that the awfulizing, it usually comes from the self-talk, we, what we say to ourselves, and it's simply not true. If we were to properly process 
the incoming data and discover that it wasn't true, then we wouldn't have the fear. The fear comes from information not properly processed, so it gets into us and produces the fear which leads to anxieties. And we live in this anxious condition when in fact God says be anxious for nothing, nothing, nothing should make you anxious. Can you imagine the transformation of your life personally if you weren't anxious about anything? That is exactly how God wants you to be. Anxiety free, no fretting, no worrying, no mental, emotional disturbances without anxiety. And so here's the problem. Lying self-talk is a result of not processing accurately the incoming data, wherever it comes from. So what should we then do? <clears throat> now, I want to start with this. I want you to be aware of the misuse of this scripture. It is, I have people tell me this scripture all the time. They quote Job, the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me, as if that were Job giving a doctrinal statement. Well, first of all, it's not a doctrinal statement. And when Job did, said this, if you go to this chapter 3 and just back up a few verses, I'm not sure what he's referring to, but watch this now. This is a man who is losing every... What happened is he was smitten with boils from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. And he had a fear about... I don't know whether he didn't want the boils on his backside because he wouldn't be able to sit down. I don't know what his fear was. But people have used this text as if God intended this to be a principle of operation. And it is not at all. So beware of the misquoting and the misapplication of this verse. Just check your own fears out. How many of the things you fear have come to pass? Now, when I was a boy, I had lots of fears. Man, I was afraid to let, when I went to bed at night, to let my hand dangle over the edge of the bed because something might nibble on my fingers. Never happened. <laughs> I was afraid of teachers. I don't know why. Teachers are afraid of students. Isn't that amazing? Parents are afraid of children. Children are afraid of parents. We got, we got, we got so many fears unfounded. And most of them never come true. I mean, just check the fears. Thousands of fears we go through that never happen. So here's where the issue lies. It is processing the information that causes fear, and most of it comes from what we say to ourselves. It comes from telling ourselves something fearful and or terrible, but we've never vetted it. We just accept it and we tell it to ourselves even though it's not true. It's never been proven true. I, I, I'll give you a series of illustrations of this in a few moments. Anxiety comes from telling ourselves things that are not true. And when we believe something that's not true, which is a failure to process information accurately, when we tell ourselves something that is not true, it produces a fear. And the fear leads to an anxious, worrisome condition. <clears throat> we must yank out the irrationalities and the lies from our thoughts and replace them with the truth. We must yank out the irrationalities and the lies from our thoughts. That is, we must stop telling ourselves stuff that's not true. Stop believing the errors. 
We must yank out the irrationalities and the lies from our thoughts and replace them. How do we do this? Here's a scripture that gives us the instruction. Cast down imaginations. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Now, by the way, not all thoughts come in the form of words. Some of them come in picture form. Some thoughts come attended with music. Some thoughts are attended from moving pictures. And so God says, you need to stop these. You need to yank these out of your thinking. You need to cast down imagination. Now watch, here's a key word. Everything that is contrary to the knowledge of God. To the truth. Now watch here. And bring into captivity... Every thought, every thought that has to do with obeying Christ. Whoa. If we do not do this, we will not eliminate anxiety. We will not eliminate the fear that provokes anxiety. Mm. We must process every incoming idea. Every single one. And that's why the scriptures begin and again in the New Testament tell us to take heed to ourselves and keep your soul diligently Whoa, keep your soul. What's your soul? Soul is your mind, your emotions. And it conducts your volition, you'll see in a moment. We must process every incoming idea. Few people think about what they think about. So we must learn to take heed to this and yank out, cast down every Wrong thought. Take heed what you hear, Jesus said. Take heed what you hear. People say things to you. Do not take them in and believe them without vetting what they tell you. This is straight from the words of the master. Take heed what you hear. Take heed. Yeah, that's a good idea. We'll, we'll actually come to that, how to check the spirit behind the ideas that come, too. Take heed what you hear. Now, here's why. With what measure you give it, it's going to be produced in you. What we receive has results. What people tell you and is not vetted is going to affect your mind, your thinking, and thus, in this case, anxiety. We must replace every wrong idea with Bible truth. We must replace every wrong idea with the Bible truth. Now, Here's what the scripture says. You shall know the truth. And the truth will make you free. Do you know how wonderful freedom is? Freedom from the pressure of being something. Freedom from the pressure of doing something. Freedom from the pressure of owning something. Freedom from the pressure of... Feeling, feeling, or getting free from the pressure of pleasing anybody but God. 
In other words, the truth is going to do that. So now what we understand is that the way to conquer this whole anxiety disorder is to remove, if you please, the wrong data, get it out, and replace it. Remember? Two acts. Cast down the imaginations, and then bring every thought into captive. Two actions. Get rid of the wrong idea, put in the right idea. Put in the knowledge of the holy. Right? You'll know the truth. The truth shall make you free. Now, what's interesting is the verse before this, I want to take you to it just so you know what truth is talking about. So if we go backwards, oh, I thought I put it in, but apparently I did not. The verse, the verse before that, you should know the truth, is talking about the truth of God's word. Okay, the next step then is to understand that if we will not control our thoughts, we will not control our mental health. If we will not control our thoughts, we will not control our mental health. That's why, and we're going to come to the scripture in detail later, in which the Lord gives us an eightfold instruction of what to think and how to think and, and a criteria for thinking. We'll, we'll get to that. It ends with think on these things. There are specific things and thoughts we should allow, and obviously a whole lot that we should not allow, okay? Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are holy, whatsoever things are a good report, if there be any praise, if there are any virtue, think on these things. We're going to come to that. But we've got to get this straight, my friends, that if we do not control our thoughts, we will not be able to control our mental health. See, one of the problems is, is what do we think about? I want to suggest to you that you compare the hours you surf on the internet with the hours you surf in the scriptures. Right now, just do a mental calculation about that yourself in a given day. Is your surfing more on the internet or in the scriptures? Because what you're doing is giving an open invitation to all kinds of stuff, whereas if you're surfing scripture, whoa, whoa, whoa. do you know what would happen in you? Do you know what would happen to your mental and emotional health? If we eliminate the wrong day, compare, as I have done lately, the number of hours in a given day that I spend in Scripture versus listening to the news. How much time do, I, do we spend watching television versus studying Scripture? If you, if you watch television for two hours a day and you read the Scriptures for 15 minutes, which one do you think you'll be most like? So that's the question. That's a rhetorical question for you to answer in your own thinking. <clears throat> we must do some serious contemplation about this. And part of the problem is because we live in a culture that's trying to get inside of us. That's why Romans 12, verse 1, is, be not conformed to the world, but be transformed. How is it? How do you get this transformation happening? How do you stop all the worries and struggles? And in fact, you know, I wish I had time. I don't know when I'll do this. I'll probably stick it in the notes maybe next Sunday. But we have so many conspiracy theories going on. Do you know that God's word tells us how to handle all the conspiracy theories? All this incoming stuff, if we will not control it, we will not be able to control our mental health. So watch this now. Because this changes the picture. If we change the incoming data from unprocessed, unvetted, self-deceiving ideas, as a different picture emerges. 
Now you have the truth that produces a condition of trust that replaces anxiety with peace and calm and tranquility and mental health. Sure. Now, if you take what we just said and you wanted to attach a clinical tag definition to it, you could call it trust therapy if you wanted to. Okay? Trust therapy is simply a matter of taking the truth about God's word into us from about every subject. That's why it comes to scriptures that say Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. That's why the scriptures say, the Lord is the strength of my life. That's why the scriptures say things like, um, the Lord is the light of my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? Ah. So, this is a way to conquer fear. So what we say to ourselves determines our mental health. What you say to yourself determines your mental health. You cannot prevent what other people say except to process it. And most of the processing requires immediate rejection. But what we say to ourselves will determine our mental health. So here comes the scriptures to affirm. There is that which speaketh like the piercings of a sword. Have you got that? You can say stuff to yourself that is like the piercing of a sword, going to set you off on a whole wrong, damaged condition. But watch this now. But the tongue of the wise produces health. You hear more of what you say to yourself than you hear from anybody else all put together. So what you say to yourself will determine your mental health. If you use your tongue to speak to yourself wisely, you will have mental health. Hallelujah. And isn't it wonderful that we have this resource called the Word of God that tells us what's the right things to say to yourself? Look at this scripture. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Got it? If you say to yourself the wrong kinds of things, they will be destructive Fear-producing and anxiety disorder is going to be the natural result. And its symptoms are a long list, by the way. Everything from can't sleep to can't eat, uh, I mean, all kinds of incapacities. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now, if you get this straight, that what you say to yourself determines your mental health, and you really grasp this, look at the last part of it, and they that eat the fruit of this, they that love it, if you get this, wow, you're going to get the results from doing this very wonderful activity of saying to yourself God's word. And this is what will happen to you. The truth produces a relaxed condition instead of fear, Trust. And guess what? No anxiety. No disorder. 
no OCD, no panic attacks, no phobias. I must say to you, beloved, that, that I'm talking to you about this with somewhat of uh, a heavy heart because the culture has gone so far astray. And it keeps trying to squeeze us. You know, when Jesus prayed for us, he says, Father, I pray not that you would take them out of the world, but that you would keep them in the world. You see, it's okay for the ship to be in the sea, but for the sea to start getting in the ship, that's trouble. And the beloved, that's why we live on an entirely different plane. And we don't revert to the mechanisms of the world to try and solve spiritual and mental issues. <clears throat> Learn to preach to yourself. Preach the word to yourself. You preach it to everybody, but you preach it to yourself. I do it all day long. I do it all day long. And, and if you're going to preach the word, you need to be instant in season. I mean, there are, it's time to preach to me right now. And out of season. And it even requires me to rebuke, to rebuke some of the incoming data and exhort myself. Look at with doctrine. Doctrine. So let me just, these are not in your notes, so let me just run through a few of these. Somebody says, nobody cares about me. So what's the truth they need? Cast all your care upon him because he cares for you. Do you understand the healing power, right? The mental switch that happens to you? Life seems hopeless. But God says, I will hold you in my right hand. If you're not, I will help thee. Somebody says, I'm lonely. He comes along and says, oh, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. Somebody else lies to themselves and says, I can't do everything I need to do. He says, I will never leave thee and I'll never forsake thee. In fact, so that you may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I, I, I tell you so happily. And this is a guess, but it's, it's a guess based on data, the stuff that I know, that in any given day of the week, I probably preached these five words to myself no less than five times a day and sometimes 25 times a day. Here they are. The Lord will help me. I say that to myself so many times because I, like you probably, have a lot, there's lots of stuff going on. Lots of stuff I have to deal with. Lots of people I have to help. Some, and I have things that are beyond me. And instead of getting anxious, I simply say and preach to myself, the Lord will help me. And I get an immediate composure. An immediate relaxation. Immediately, I get a tranquil setting into my mind. A tranquility. The Lord will help me. The Lord will help me. Wow. People don't treat me nicely. Who cares? I will not fear what men will do unto me. People seem to be against me. <laughs> Who cares? If God before me, who can be against me? I feel insecure. I'll say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress. <laughs> Him will I trust. The news is so depressing. But the Lord's the light of my salvation. Whom shall I fear? So the first foundation of mental health in the scriptures is no fear. Now, I'm going to try as quickly as I can to give you the second one. And next week, three and four. But number two, 
It's power. We're not God. These are what God has given you. Not the spirit of fear, but he has given you power. So what is that? So I have to come up with a, a definition here. And so this is my own devising, but you judge it. It is both the intrinsic and derived ability to act in a controlled matter, manner. I'm going to show you the difference between the intrinsic, that is self-possessed, and the derived power that comes from God. Okay, Two different power sources that are yours. So he's not given a spirit of fear, but he's given us power to act. Power to do something about life, about our situation. He's given us power. He's given you the power to detox your soul, to detox your mind, to transfer out what should not be there and put in what should be there. He's given you the ability to do that. There is no more damaging false doctrine in my thinking today than the notion of moral inability. Can't help but lying. I can't help but stealing. Why would God hold you accountable for something you can't stop doing? Doesn't make any sense at all. And we've got this idea that I can't. But God comes along and says you can, and if you don't think you can, then I'm going to give you some more can-do power. And that's why you learn to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So whatever power you, he has given you an intrinsic power, but in addition to that, he's given you his divine power to help you over and above your own. This is a delightful thing, my friends. <clears throat> the power and the ability to command your soul. To take control of your mind. Con and by the way, as you well know already from previous teaching, feelings come from the thoughts you think. You think a lust thought, you're going to get a lust feeling one. You think a bitter thought, you're going to get a bitter feeling. You think a loving thought, you're going to get a loving feeling. Because feelings come from the thoughts we think. But having the ability to command your soul is vitally important. David exercised this when he said in Psalm 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul. I'm telling you, soul. I'm telling you, mind. I'm telling you, emotions. Start blessing the Lord. Bless the Lord. And look at this. And all that is within me. I want, I want all of me, God. I'm telling all of me to bless you. Learning to command your soul is a power that God has given you so that you not only can eliminate the fear, but you have the ability of choice. Bless the Lord of my soul, forgetting out all his benefits. He says it again. And look at this one. Why art thou cast down? By the way, this phrase, whoops, oh, sorry about that. This phrase, cast down, is the Bible uh, term for depression. A cast down soul is the Bible way of expressing what depression is. So why art thou depressed, O my soul? And, and look at this. And, and why art thou anxious, O oh my? Why art thou disquieted or anxious within me? Why is it? So when you have this question in front of you, why this depression and why this anxiety? Watch how the response of David is. Hope thou in God. And guess what? It's all over. It doesn't matter why. If you put your hope and your trust in God and look at this, hope in God instead 
for I shall yet praise him who is the, look at the health, the health of my countenance because your mental, emotional condition shows on your face and it changes it right to your countenance. When we exercise the power and ability to command our souls, which we're able to do, we will control our mental health. When you exercise the power and the ability, which you're able to do, you will control your mental health. So God's not saying, not just not fear, but I'm giving you power. The ability to act, the ability to decide, the ability to choose. Because here's what would otherwise happen. He that has no rule over his own spirit is like a city that's broken down in the walls. If we do not exercise this power, we're like a city. The wall's broken down. And all the enemies in ancient times, the walls kept the enemies out. Anybody can come in, do anything, say anything, do anything, damage, ransack. <clears throat> Not a nice place to live. So we must rule our own spirits. This is an interesting insight as well, and I almost come to a conclusion here. Receiving the end of your faith. Now, watch this. The salvation of your soul. I'm not talking about your spirit, the redeemed spirit. It's talking about your mind and your emotions. Ultimately, God wants, you know, when you got right with God, you got your heart right. Now he's interested in getting your head right. First one is salvation. The second one is sanctification. We want to get our heads right. Getting the salvation to enter into our minds and our souls. So let me conclude with this story. It's the Gideon story we referred to earlier. And the angel of the Lord. Now, So God sends an angel down. And he gives him an assignment. He says, now this is this guy. He's a farmer. When you get there, you will not be impressed. He's disheveled looking. He's just out there. Um, he, he's, out, he, he's out there working with the sheaves and doing what the farmers do. And he won't look like anything that you think uh, you should be telling him. But this is what I want you to tell him. When you find this farmer in the field angel I want you to tell him I am with him and that he is a mighty man of valor the angel thinks nothing of it comes down looks at and he says God's right and it's a good thing God gave me a warning about this this guy looks nothing like a man of valor but true to his message from the Lord he says to him the Lord is with you. Look at this. Thou mighty man of valor. And guess what? God has probably said something similar to you, but watch this. And Gideon says, Oh, my Lord. OMG. If the Lord be with us, why then is why are we in this condition? Like, uh, yeah. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Now watch this. This is so this man had not used to this kind of data input. And out of the Dismal farmer's field comes an angel voice and calls the mighty man of valor, and he doesn't believe it. And the angel says to him, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites, because I've sent you. And 
the Lord said unto him, I'll be with thee. So here you've got a parallel of power. Go in this thy might. You've got to do your part. And you're able to do it. Thou mighty man of valor, go do it. Then the derived power. And I will be with thee. And you will smite these thousands of Midianites as if they were just one single man. It's going to be real easy. What's the lesson here? You plus God can do anything. It requires the you and it requires God. Your power, God's power, working together. So finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Four-fold foundation of mental health. Number one, no fear. You get, you get rid of anxiety. Number two, recognize that God has given you the power to change. And he'll help you do it. And number three and four, we go next time we get together. And number three is startling. Love. And we will find out that love is the most intelligent way to live as well as the most mentally healthy course of life. Somebody says something evil towards you. At that moment, if you respond out of love, you stay mentally healthy. Somebody says something bad against you and you don't respond out of love and you become bitter, you have just lost a degree of your mental health. And we're going to take that teaching to the Zenith next Sunday morning. And then we're going to conclude with the last one, which is Remember? I'm not given a spirit of fear, power, love, and a sound mind. What is a sound mind? What are the ingredients of a sound mind as defined by the scriptures? So that's where we're going. And I hope you find it really a blessing. So next Sunday, hopefully, we'll get to the biblical ingredients of mental health. What does the Bible mean by a sound mind. And I tell you, dear friends, they are delightful. But at the bottom line of this is my prayer for you, is that you receive this instruction so that you will be mentally healthy. In the name of Jesus.